before here. we start, one of the, the things, having enjoyed a, a, a beautiful meal here, a little story I want to tell you about a couple of Inuit uh, fishermen who are out on the ice, ice fishing. And uh, so one, fi one fisherman has got him set up and he's pulling fish out like you wouldn't believe. And the other guy is not catching anything. So after a little bit of time, he comes over to the first guy and says, what is it you're, you're doing? And, and the first guy says, mm -hmm. what? Mm -hmm. You've got to keep the bait warm. <laughs> So the one part, I think, of the world, this was a, a, a great introduction to, to a global gathering. But the one part I didn't hear too much about, I heard Finland and Finland and, uh, and Calgary as the northern parts. And they're certainly north of Houston, but they're not that far north. Tonight I want to talk to you a little bit about, about the Arctic. The, the obligatory part of when you start with the Arctic is to show these uh, cuddly polar bears. But if we go to the next slide, We'll see that polar, and this is sort of the introduction that we normally have in, in the oil patch where we show a safety moment to start. If you see polar bears, you better get out of there. Polar bears run faster, swim faster, are 800 pounds on average, and they're always hungry. So don't stick around if there's polar bears in the area. What I want to talk to tonight is just a sort of overview of some of the exciting things that have happened in the past in the Arctic and the future. The Arctic is really one of the few parts of, of this planet that is still unknown. And so the title leads a little explanation between the existentialism and the, and the adventures. Adventures are, are, are things you undertake, journeys or, or, or travels in life, uh, either physical or otherwise, where you, you have some excitement because there's some unknown part. And the Arctic is still largely unknown. And we'll talk about that a little bit. The existential part is that a lot of what we do in the Arctic is still experience-based rather than, than science-based, and that's part of what I want to talk about now. The, the image in the background is an important one, and it has happened recently, and I'll talk to that in a moment. If we go back in history, um, geopolitics, of course, plays an important part in, in all we do every day. But we can go back five or six centuries to understand why the Northwest Passage is important. Back a, few, a couple of years after Columbus sailed the oceans, Pope Alexander actually decided that the world should be divided between Portugal and Spain, who were the two major maritime nations at the time. Of course, they weren't the only nations that were important, uh, particularly England and the Netherlands took exception to that, but, but they had no way to do that, notwithstanding that neither Spain nor Portugal could actually enforce these lines, but we see these to exist today. Why is Brazil Portuguese and the rest of South America is, is Spanish-speaking? Why are the Philippines uh, Spanish-speaking, but we have Goa and, and Macau that were still in, in uh, Portuguese and, and uh, provinces in Africa? So these, these things stick with us a long time. What this division did, though, was really drive the northern European nations to find an alternative route to the Orient. Next slide. So I'll focus this. The Arctic is, is actually, there's a lot of parts, but I'm going to focus this on the Northwest Passage, or Northwest Passages, actually, because there's not a single passage. What we, what we see in, in the northern parts of Canada, even today it's kind of interesting because Canada claims the Northwest Passage as internal routes and it claims that it ends in the Beaufort Sea and Canadian waters. More internationally, most people look at the Northwest Passage as being a combined U.S. and Canadian route and ending in the Bering Strait. And, and as the U.S. still has not a signature to the, 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 the Law of the Sea Conference, there's still some dispute that goes on there. But not between Canada and the U.S., there's not a, not a serious uh, dispute. Next. It's only fairly recently in human time that we've actually had ships that sailed through. We've been trying to go through the Northwest Passage for 500 years, but it's only in this, uh, about 100 years ago, when in fact Roald Amundsen, the uh, Norwegian explorer, was able to sail a ship from one side to the other. But it took him three years, and it didn't go continuously. He spent two winters at Joachaven and then one in the, in the uh, Turchill Island. And then when, in 1906, when he finally made it to the West Coast, we just had the major San Francisco earthquakes so sort of overshadowed his arrival there. However, this ship, Joa, is still in, it's been preserved in, in Oslo, and any time you get a chance to visit that, it's well worth doing, because it's in the same area where the Viking ships are preserved, the Contiki, the Fram, and others, and it's something, at least anyone that's interested in any kind of boats, but there's a good bit of history there, too. Next slide. I'm a Canadian, you can probably tell from my accent, and it, it's, 
It's with some pride that I claim a Canadian was actually the first to sail continuously through the Northwest Passage. He was actually a sergeant in the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, but he didn't ride around with a red uniform on the horse. He actually had a ship, the St. Roch. And the St. Roch during the Second World War was actually dispatched. At one time, there was an idea that Canadians would actually occupy Greenland because there were German weather stations there that were, were being used to direct U-boats. And so the Canadians never actually did that, but the St. Roch was dispatched as a, as a vessel that might be able to be of some use. In the end, that didn't happen. And they turned around and sailed back. And they sailed continuously through the Northwest Passage, 84 days from Halifax to, to Victoria. And that's really the first voyage through the Northwest Passage that I count as a voyage, a non-stop, not wintering over. We skip ahead a, a couple of years, or a few years, to the 1960, 69, 70. Next slide. If you remember, the, in the oil patch, we discovered oil in Alaska on the North Slope in the, in the late 60s. And we're looking at two options. One was a marine transportation mound, and one was a, an Alaska pipeline to the south and then into marine. And as part of that, Humble Oil, uh, Exxon, made a, a, a significant experiment. And they took a, a ship that existed, a relatively new ship that had been built in, in the US, and converted it into the world's largest icebreaker, and sailed it to the Northwest Passage two years in a row, 1969, 1970. In the end, they built a pipeline. We all know today about the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, uh, based mostly on price, although I think the budget for the trans alaska Pipeline went 4,000% over budget, so I'm not sure that was the best decision. But we all know today how difficult it is to, to budget mega projects. If we move forward again, we found that uh, not only was there oil onshore in the North Slope, but there was a lot of offshore oil, particularly in the Canadian uh, Beaufort Sea. And, and in Canada in the, the 70s and 80s, there were incentives from the government and a lot of alignment between the government and industry to go and explore for oil unlike what we see today in Alaska, where the government and industry are totally misaligned. But that led to a lot of developments in the, in the Northwest Passage, really some very unique ships that were built, because people were willing to experiment. And this is where a little bit of the existentialism came. These were not developed over long times of research. This was technology that was put in place and worked. Uh, this is a unique ship that was really a game changer in Roland. It's actually still in service today, although it's, it's uh, owned in Russia and operates. But it, it had a lot of features, and I won't dwell on those tonight, but you'll get a chance to, to think about those in, later. The two companies that were most active in the area at the time were, were Dome Petroleum and uh, Gulf Canada. And this is the Gulf Canada fleet. So between these two companies, there was a lot of innovation to place in a very compressed time. And I think we see that a lot in our, our industry, that, that when there's a real need, we often see these spurts of innovation where things come in. And I'm a great believer that, that research in itself is not, is not what drives things. It's really the, the need that, that to have technology, to do a bus business in some form that drives that. And oftentimes, the research to support that comes after the fact. And we've seen that in all kinds of areas, Deepwater Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we've seen it in the Arctic and other areas. If we come today, we see a lot of talk about transpolar shipping, uh, that the, the Arctic ice is melting and we'll be able to sail along the, the northern sea route and cut 4,000 miles off the, the thing. I'm here to put some caution on that. Next slide. So, so we look at um, the routes that, that we see across the road. We've got the, nor the northern sea route, which is along the Russian coast. We've got the northwest passage along the Canadian route. And we've got a, a transpolar route down the middle. All of these have been talked about. All of them have been sailed in the past, but none really in a truly commercial mode. Uh, and there are, of course, other issues around these things. The, the Russians, for example, understand that you can save time and money by going along the Northern Sea Route rather than going the Suez Canal. But if you tell them you're going to save $400,000 in fuel, guess what the fees are going to be to sail there? They're not going to be a dollar. They're going to be 399000 So there's going to be a commercial trade-off that people often, often ignore when they're looking at that. Just to look at what the, what's actually happening in the Arctic, uh, we, we of course always read headlines about the Arctic, the ice is going to go away, there'll be an ice-free Arctic. These are the last three winters, and, and in, if you look closely at them, you can see there's actually a line that shows the, the average outline of ice for the last 30 years. It hasn't changed in the winter time. We're getting the same amount of ice in the winter as we always have. In the summertime, in, 19, uh, in sorry, 2012, we definitely had a big dip, the first slide there. But in the last two years, we've had 30 40% more ice. I'm still waiting to see a headline that people say 
oh, the ice is recovering in the Arctic, it's not going away, because people still refer to the ice diminishing, but it's not. And this sort of shows it. With the, the broad gray band shows the statistical variation of ice, and you see the dotted line at the bottom, which actually shows what the 2012 minimum was, but in fact, we're built back up again. And in the Arctic, the ice tends to survive more than one winter. So we have first year ice, which basically grows and melts in the same season. We have second year ice, which has survived one winter, third year ice, fourth year ice. So once we've got a minimum ice, it takes a few years to build up. It's not, uh, not just an annual variation. And the ice is building back up. I think what we can say is that there are certainly variations in the Arctic, but what causes them, I don't think we're in a, in a position to really say. And if anyone's thinking of in the Arctic, they better have an ice-worthy ship because they're going to encounter ice somewhere along the route. The, what we do see in the Arctic is not transpolar shipping, but shipping, destinational shipping. We see uh, ships that are used to, to supply uh, communities throughout the Arctic. We see a lot of mining development. Mining development in the Arctic is, is actually relatively straightforward because the shipping component can be done seasonally. You can, you can mine lead zinc ore or nickel ore and you can store it and ship it out over three or four months. That's not true for hydrocarbons. If you find oil or gas, you pretty much have to have continuous shipping. So that's not happening yet. The other thing we're seeing quite a lot of is, is, is uh, recreational or pleasure shipping. Everything from people taking kayaks and small yachts through to, to large ships. And, and that's quite a concern because there are no infrastructure in terms of ports or search and rescue facilities to, to help people in that regard. And I think it's only a matter of time before we see some serious incidents there. Just to sort of wrap up, this, this year, 2014, has been an extremely busy year in the, in the North American Arctic. We've seen uh, Franklin ships. Franklin was the British explorer who was uh, trying to find the Northwest Passage in 1845 or so. And, and two ships were lost, and all of, he and all his crew of about 150 people, two ships, were gone. And there's a lot of sagas about what happened to them and did they eat each other in the end and what, what eventually happened. This year, we actually found one of his ships, and I'll talk a minute about that. Amundsen, who we heard earlier with Joa, after he, he made the successful Joa, he actually went back and built another ship called the Maud that, that eventually was wrecked in Canada, and the Norwegians are trying to salvage that. Now, they, they were trying to get to it this year, but in fact, it, it didn't work easily because of the ice. We've also seen a lot of activities, uh, including two Canadian icebreakers going to the North Pole, because there's still a bit of geopolitical posturing about saying who owns the North Pole. And there is a claim that you can make under the law of the sea that says if you can show the geology under the ocean is contiguous with the geology within your 200 mile limit, you might be able to claim it. So both the Russians, Canadians, and the, and the Greenlanders are trying to drill holes at the North Pole to find out who owns what. And finally, just right now, there is a, an ice-breaking bulk carrier uh, which is on its way, in fact, just yesterday, October the 1st, passed through the Bering Strait on its way to China that actually started its, its voyage in uh, Ungava Peninsula in the entrance to Hudson Strait. So the, there were two ships that Franklin used. They were both interesting ships because they were built in the early 1800s during the Napoleonic War period, and they were built as bomb ships. Bomb ships were very sturdily built ships that were not built for fighting at sea. They were built for naval bombardment and for blockading ports. And so these ships were, were extremely stoutly built. After the, the Napoleonic Wars were over, they were used for, for an, first Antarctic, and anyone knew your geography, there are two, two active volcanoes in the Arctic, Mount Erebus and Mount Terror, which are named after those two ships. One of the interesting connections for, for the Terror was she was actually engaged in the Battle of Baltimore in 1814 when Fort McHenry was being shelled and the, the Star Spangled Banner was flying through the rocket's red glare. HMS Terror was probably the ship that was filing the rockets that had the, had the red glare. Anyway, about, about 1845, 46, she sank. These are, are sonar images. The ship was discovered about a month ago in relatively shallow water in the Arctic. And that's one of the things about the Arctic. I mean, how could a ship like this remain undiscovered for 150 years? Because it was only, it was only a few meters below the surface. But it was. And if you look there, you can see it's a relatively short, wide ship, which is the, the construction of and relatively little damage, a little bit of stove in on the bow. And I think there's every likelihood that we will actually salvage that ship and bring it back. There was an interesting little bit of politics there because the ship's actually still owned by the Queen of England. So they had to sort of ask her permission to do things to it. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs>
Next. Next slide. Uh, the Maud was Amundsen's uh, purpose-built ship, and after he sailed the Joa through, which was an old fishing vessel, he decided he'd continue his Arctic explorations. The Maud was named after Queen Maud, who was actually one of Queen Victoria's granddaughters, who was married to the new king of Norway, because as some of you may know, Norway only became an independent country in, in 1906, actually the same year he sailed through the passage. So this was a prestigious project to have the Maud. Actually, he sailed through, through the Arctic and, and didn't have a very successful voyage, ran out of money, and eventually the ship was sold to the Hudson's Bay Company, who were the commercial entity in northern Canada, and used as a store ship. It sank in Cambridge Bay and has remained there for a long time, and now the Norwegians have decided, since uh, they are certainly a maritime nation and they certainly have lots of money, that they should salvage this and bring it back to Norway, and that will probably happen next year. They got there this year, but only by the skin of their teeth. And, and it'll take them another year at least before they get back. Next. So there's a lot of activity by, by uh, government icebreakers, and, and it's interesting some of the governments that are playing in the Arctic. Next. Uh, two Canadian icebreakers have sailed to the North Pole to engage in this, uh, this geological uh, game that we're playing up there right now. Next. Um, the, the Chinese have an Arctic icebreaker, the Su Long, the ice dragon. And she went to 81 degrees north, which is pretty far north of Alaska, unescorted, on her own, didn't ask permission from anybody, and they stayed there for a month before they came home. Next. The Koreans did the same. They were off Alaska. In fact, it was an interesting little incident because they had an injury to one of their, their uh, people that needed an airlift. And the U.S. Coast Guard, by good luck, not by planning, happened to have some air assets available in Barrow and we're able to, to take the person off and get them to hospital. Next. U.S. Coast Guard. In the U.S., we're actually pretty deficient in assets that can go in the Arctic. We have three icebreakers. Uh, Polar Sea and Polar Star were built in the 70s. Only one is operational. The other one provides spare parts for the one that's operational, and, and they're old ladies. The, the Healy, the, the one we saw there, uh, was deployed, but it's entirely directed by the National Science Foundation. The Coast Guard operated, but it's entirely directed in science missions, so it's actually of no uh, practical use for actual uh, marine-type operations in the Arctic. Next. Now, the, the thing that's most exciting, we actually have seen right now, in the last two weeks, a commercial voyage uh, through the Northwest Passage. Next. This is a ship, the, the Nudovic, which is called a Polar Class 4 ship, which means it can sail through substantial ice unaided, uh, about a 28,000 ton bulk carrier, and it sailed from, from northern Quebec, next slide, uh, Ungava Peninsula, where there's a major uh, nickel mine. There's a lot of nickel in the Arctic. They, we haven't talked about the Russian Arctic, but there's major nickel mines there too. So a lot of the nickel in the world is coming out of the Arctic. The, the mine is called, uh, back, the uh, mine is called Canadian Royalties, which of course means it's 100% owned by the Chinese, and that's a good name to call it. <laughs> And, and the cargo is going to China. But they, they decided that they would test this route. So you can see there they, they took a route that basically yesterday passed through the, the Bering Strait into the Pacific and will continue a few days more. And uh, this is a fairly unique thing. They found, they found a lot of ice in, in some parts of the thing, but were able to navigate it successfully. But I don't think they plan on doing that on a regular basis. They might get one or two voyages in the summer and save some fuel. but. Generally, they're not going to be able to do that. They'll continue shipping in the more open water route to the south. Next. So there's still a lot of things we need to worry about in the Arctic. We need to worry about the Arctic environment. As I said, I, I, I'm not a believer that we, we have, that we humans are causing all global warming. There's certainly global chi climate change taking place, and we've seen that for a long time. My own feeling is the relative stability we've seen in climate for the last 30 or 40 years may be the unusual part. I think change is probably what's more normal. But that doesn't give us any license to pollute or do any other things. People are important. People in the Arctic, not just people to gain knowledge of how to operate, but people live there. And there's a lot of traditional knowledge which come, can be fed back into the system. Transportation logistics. There are no deep water ports, uh, particularly in the Western Arctic. Alaska, the closest deep water port is Dutch Harbor, and it's not much of a port. You go to north, north of Dutch Harbor, and you have ports that have three or four meters draft at them. I mean, these are not ports, they're beaches, basically. And so there's a lot of work still to do, and I think we'll see that ongoing, notwithstanding that we've seen a little bit of hiatus uh, based on the oil drilling and other things, both in Alaska with Shell having some problems there, and now 
in, in the uh, Soviet or the ex-Soviet Union, Russia, where we're seeing the, the problems that have been brought on by the, uh, the Crimea and Ukraine. And that'll delay things, but it won't stop. I think that'll go forward. Thanks. And finally, just to let you know that I, I first sailed into the Arctic in 1965 in Norway. And uh, I've always promised my wife, my wife and I actually built a tug and barge and sailed the full length of the Mackenzie River from Great Slave Lake down to the Arctic Ocean in 1969. She'd never been back in the Arctic. So last, this summer, we actually made it back to North Cape in Norway, which is the most northerly part of, the, uh, of Europe. And so that's just to show you that I'm keeping up my Arctic credentials and things. So, so thank you for listening. Thank you.